The type of solvent used can have a huge effect on whether a reaction proceeds via an SN1 mechanism or via an SN2 mechanism. So let's look at polar protic solvents first. Polar protic solvents favor SN1 mechanisms. And let's look at an example of a polar protic solvent, which, which is, of course, water right here. So water is a polar molecule. right? So we know that oxygen is partially negative, and we know that this hydrogen here is partially positive due to differences in electronegativity. And we can consider wa water to be a protic solvent because this proton here is attached to an electronegative atom, which is oxygen, which means that it's, it's relatively easy for water to donate a proton in solution. So if water donated a proton, you would form, of course, OH minus, the hydroxide anion. So water is a polar protic solvent. Uh, if we took off this one of these hydrogens and put an alkyl group on there, right? so now we had R. OH like that, we would of course have an alcohol. And alcohols are also classified as polar protic solvents, right? This this proton right here is attached to an electronegative atom, so alcohols can donate protons if, if, if the uh, situation is, is right. And uh, another example would be a carboxylic acid, right? So if I go ahead and draw a carboxylic acid in here, once again, we have a proton. Right, that is bonded to an electronegative atom. Right, so that proton could be donated in solution. So these are your uh, three, your your three, your three main polar protic solvents that you will see, and they favor SN1 reactions. So let's look at uh, an SN1 mechanism and let's see why a polar protic solvent favors SN1. So if I started off with an alkyl halide here, so I have some R groups attached to my carbon. And I have that carbon attached to a bromine like that. The first step in an SN1 mechanism is dissociation, right? This lone pair of electrons is going to kick off onto my bromine. And that takes away a bond to our carbon, right? So we form a carbocation, right? So this carbon is now positively charged because it lost a bond. The bromine over here picks up a lone pair of electrons, which gives it a negative one formal charge. And let's say water was our was our polar protic solvent here. So water would come along, right? And we know that the uh, we know the oxygen is partially negative, right? So we have opposite charges, and opposite charges attract, right? The partially negative oxygen is a, is a, attracted to the carbocation, right? So this lone pair of electrons, right, is going to is going to be attracted to this positively charged carbon, and Opposite charge attract is going to help to stabilize the carbocation. Remember, the more stable your carbocation, the more likely your reaction is going to proceed via an SN1 mechanism. Also, the, your your uh, your polar protic solvent, your water, could help to stabilize your leaving group too, because we know that the hydrogen is partially positive, right? So you're going to get a little bit of attraction there between the, pos the partially positive. Uh, hydrogen or proton and the negatively charged leaving group like that. So polar protic solvents solvate both cations and anions. And since polar protic solvents help to stabilize your carbocation, right, that favors an SN1 mechanism. All right, our second group of solvents are called the polar aprotic solvents. So this would be polar polar aprotic like that. So a good example of a polar aprotic solvent is acetone. So let's look at the dot structure for acetone here. So it would look like with our carbonyl and then two methyl groups attached to our carbon. So that's acetone. All right, we, we know that there's some polarity involved because the oxygen is partially negative and the carbon is partially positive. And acetone is considered to be aprotic, right? The protons that are present in acetone are attached to carbon, which is not a very electronegative atom. So it's considered to be aprotic, meaning it doesn't really donate protons very well in solution. Now, in reality, acetone can donate protons if the situation is right. But compared to the polar protic solvents, those protons on acetone are not very easily donated. Right? So this is acetone right here. And that's one example of a polar aprotic solvent. Let's look at, at another example of a polar aprotic solvent. And it has a similar structure to acetone. All right, so if I put a sulfur right here instead of a carbon, and I have sulfur double bonded to oxygen like that, and I have two methyl groups right here, another methyl 
group right here, and then there has to be a lone pair of electrons on that sulfur atom. Uh, this is DMSO, right? So DMSO, which stands for dimethyl sulfoxide. So dimethyl sulfoxide also has a resonance structure, right? So if I if I go ahead and draw some brackets here and if I think about what would be the resonance structure for DMSO, this lone pair of electrons in here could kick off onto my oxygen. All right, so let's draw what that would look like now. Now our sulfur has a methyl group here, a methyl group here, still has a lone pair of electrons. Now it's only bonded once to that oxygen. This oxygen has three lone pairs of electrons like that, giving it a negative one formal charge. The sulfur gets a positive one formal charge. So this is our resonance structure for DMSO. And remember, of course, in reality, it's, it's a little bit more of a hybrid, and maybe the resonance structure on the left is, uh, is a greater contributor to our, re to our resonance hybrid. But I'm actually going to be using this, this drawing on the right to illustrate some points about polar aprotic solvents. Okay, so so that, that resonance structure on the right is the one I'm going to use in a few minutes. Uh, another example of a polar aprotic solvent would be DMF. So let's go ahead and look at DMF here. So the structure for DMF, which stands for dimethylformamide, it's going to have right, a carbonyl right here, like that. And then we have a hydrogen and a nitrogen, and that's where our two methyl groups come in, and a lone pair of electrons on our nitrogen. So if we draw the resonance structure for DMF, Right, we can see how it's very similar to the two examples from above. Right, so this lone pair of electrons on nitrogen can kick in here to form a double bond. At the same time, these electrons kick off onto our oxygen. So this is our possible resonance structure. Right, the oxygen is going to pick up a lone pair of electrons and get a negative one formal charge. Lone pair of electrons moves in here. Right, double bond between your carbon and your nitrogen, and that gives this nitrogen here a plus one formal charge. So those are our resonance structures for DMF, another good polar aprotic solvent. So polar aprotic solvents favor an SN2 reaction. Okay, so polar aprotic solvents, polar aprotic favor an SN2 reaction, and they do so by increasing the strength of the nucleophile. So if we were to think about a nucleophile, right, let's say our reaction was, was, some, was an alkyl halide with you know, sodium hydroxide or something like that, so Na, Na plus OH minus. Our nucleophile is the hydroxide anion, and a polar aprotic solvent is going to increase the nucleophilic strength of that hydroxide anion, and let's, let's look at why. So, if I if I take uh, if I took this the second resonance structure from DMSO right and I showed I showed how this resonance structure interacts with sodium hydroxide let's see what happens okay so I'm going to take I'm going to take that DMSO molecule and I'm going to show it interacting with both of the ions right so first we'll start with the sodium cation so here I have my positively charged Right, sodium cation, and then the DMSO is going to interact with it because if I look at that second resonance structure, right, the oxygen is negatively charged. Right, so I have my DMSO, and I'm I'm not going to bother with the rest of the DMSO molecule. I'm just going to draw on the skeleton here because I want you to see how the negatively charged oxygen or the partial the partially negatively charged oxygen is going to interact with that sodium cation. Right, so if I have all of these DMSO molecules, right, they would all surround that 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 po positively charged sodium cation, and they will solvate it. Right, so there's going to be an attraction between the, all these opposite charges, and that sodium cation is said to be solvated. Right, it's surrounded by solvent, and so that that's that shows you that polar aprotic solvents are good solvators of cations, and that that kind of removes that positive charge from the nucleophile, which which of course helps to increase the nucleophilic strength. It does not. Being, since it's not ionically bonded to the sodium, that, that increases its, its ability to function as a nucleophile. And then there's another reason why polar aprotic solvents favor the S, SN2 and increase the nucleophilic strength of the hydroxide anion. So let's, let's go ahead and show our hydroxide anion floating around here, right? It's negatively charged. And the DMSO comes along, right? And we know that on that second resonance structure there for DMSO, right, this is negatively charged, the sulfur is positively charged. Well, you might think, oh, well, the positively charged sulfur 
could solvate our hydroxide anion. And the reason that does not occur is because of steric hindrance, right? These two methyl groups here on the DMSO prevent that hydroxide anion from getting in there and bonding with that positively charged sulfur on that resonance structure. So polar aprotic solvents are poor solvators of anions. And that means that our, hyd our hydroxide anion, right, it's just out here, it's not really bonding with anything, which increases the strength of the nucleophile. And anytime you increase the strength of the nucleophile, you're going to favor an SN2 reaction, since the mechanism of an SN2 reaction requires the use of a strong nucleophile. In the next video, we'll go into all of the differences between SN1 and SN2 reactions. We'll sum up everything we know, and we will include what we've learned in this video, the effect of the solvent.